transition. As we switch the focus from the filing volume to the new case volume, uh, you'll see that shift in, um, in, in the, the, the month in which that coronavirus uh, pandemic had an impact on the new case filing volume. And so we looked at it from uh, a March to March time period. Uh, you, you see that um, we're growing about 12%. But if you go into April, where we actually started to see the reduction of those new cases last year at about 31 and a half thousand new cases in the month of April, uh, this month, uh, we're tracking towards about 45,000 cases. So as of uh, the day before yesterday, we were at 39,000. So we're on track to get about 45,000 new cases uh, this month. And if you look at that, that's a 42% increase uh, from where we were. Uh, so uh, picking up a, a, a pretty, pretty healthy chunk uh, and being able to get back to where we uh, thought we should be in terms of the program's health. Uh, as well as the filings and new cases being filed across the state of Texas. That green line that you see going across the top is, is really the average uh, that we had in the pre-pandemic volume uh, before the pandemic became impactful. So we're right at where we need to be. And you'll go up and you'll go down on some of those volumes uh, to, to hit that average. But it's a good sign that we see March and we, we anticipate April being um, in a higher state with, with more volume there. Has there been a steady increase, Terry, from, it looks like from April of last year on? I, I look at this and I think, wow, we're doing a great job. But I also look at it and I think of the judicial backlog that has to be out there for trial settings right. um, based on where the filings are going. Um, so right. we'll have to keep that in mind. I mean, not that we would do anything. We're doing a this is a great job. We're getting more cases filed. It's just the resolution needs to probably pick up. Pace. Yeah, and I and Judge, I think one of the things that David's working on with the legislature is um, running different things that we can do through judicial counsel so that that um, the legislature can help too, so that we can try to alleviate some of that backlog because we definitely see that uh, building on the back end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, one of the things that we're um, starting to put some some pretty significant focus on is is obviously those eviction cases haven't been filed. Uh, we saw a similar trend in debt collections with some of the uh, the moratoriums on evictions and then debt collection kind of following suit. Uh, the 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 thing that we don't know is how many of those cases will rebound and what will that rebound look like? And will they, will they rebound? Will they ever come back or will they just um, be, be kind of like airline tickets? Just, it was, it was missed and we're moving on. We don't know what that looks like, but that, that does pose a potential for um, a significant increase in case volume here in the coming months. As we look through like November and December, that's pretty typical where we see a reduction in volume just because of the holidays. Uh, January, sometimes that falls uh, right past because people are uh, prolonging those holidays. Uh, and then February was hit with that winter storm event. So uh, I think March is going to be uh, indicative of what we'll see uh, come uh, the end of this month. And I think that that'll kind of set the tone for the rest of the year in terms of the new case volume, uh, it, with the exception of those uh, potential rebound uh, case types like evictions and, and debt collection. Okay, so uh, on the redaction front, um, we, we've seen a similar trend uh, in uh, last month in March and in April, uh, where we've seen an increase. I think that this falls uh, in, in line with, with kind of the expectations and with the, the data that we're seeing in terms of filing volume and new case volume. Uh, so we saw uh, about a 2000 uh, uh, utilization increase uh, from what our normal average is, which is around 14,000. Uh, usages of redaction a month. Uh, it, it, we've seen it at 16,000. I think you'll see a similar trend here in the month of April. Uh, just with that new volume coming in or the higher volume, I should say, um, the utilization should should be um, kind of following in the same pattern, which is what we're seeing here. So that's a that's a good sign that that the system is working and they're continuing to use it uh, in a in a pattern that's commensurate with the volume of new cases and filings. Uh, from the e-filing perspective, again, just on the JP side, uh, we're approaching 150 precincts across 36 counties that are currently live on the system. We've got 12 active engagements 
uh, and three engagements that we just haven't gotten around to kicking off just yet. Uh, but the JPs are contributing to more than uh, about 94, 95,000 filings per month. So they're approaching that 100,000 filing mark, which is, which is interesting to see, especially since it's permissive, uh, but the counties are, are choosing to embrace it. Um, we hope that this continues uh, that trend and that more JP precincts uh, jump on board and begin to uh, digitize and electronic, uh, electronic uh, make their processes more electronic, I should say, uh, and then begin using more of the uh, virtual way of, of conducting those uh, filings and getting them into the courts. Uh, but I think time will tell. Um, I, I think it's a natural trend that we'll see this uh, pick up, but I think kind of like the district and county clerks uh, in, in courts here in Texas, um, the mandate I think will be a, a thing that would really, you know, obviously increase the, the uh, volume and the utilization quite a bit. Hey Terry, this is uh, John Warren. Of, uh, of those JP uh, courts that are doing e-filing, what's the percentage that are all of those um, JP courts, are they using um, Odyssey or are they using various forms of a case management system or something else? Yeah, I think it's a it's a mixed bag, John. Um, I, I don't think that, um, you know, we, we I think what another uh, of maybe perspective or cut of this view of this would be would be the integrations, because I don't think that all of the JPs are integrated. I think some of them are just using the system, but using it in a manual download model, which is still a good form of getting those electronic uh, filings and mm -hmm. cases coming in. But I, I think it's a mixed bag. I don't think it's all uh, you know, Odyssey, Tyler, case management systems. I think that there's case management systems um, just in general that are using the system. And so it's a, it's a wide array. So the, the, so a, a percentage of those, they don't have a case management system, but they are, but they are using the, um, uh, a document management system to maintain their records. Yeah, I, you know, I'd, I'd have to look into that, John, on whether or not they have a case management system. You know, each uh -huh. one of those would be individual independent engagements, and, and we don't have the view of who, which so, JP precincts across the state have a system today, but we do when we get engaged with them. So we would have that information across the ones that are locked. And we just don't have Terry, to, Terry, to build on that a little bit, I know that when OCA was doing a, we did a, a project with TextDot a few years ago that involved the JPs and munis. And we did do a survey, John, that, that asked them, what case management system do you use? Um, I, I'll have to go dig for those survey results. And, and granted, they're a few years old, but at, at the time it was running in the 40 to 50% range had no, what you would call a case management system. So if they are using e-filing, it's to you know accept it, download the stamped copy and put it in either file folders or print it out or, you know, some kind of rudimentary kind of system. But well, that's a little, that's a little odd because if you're going to accept it over the counter, why would you encourage people to um, file it electronically when you end up, when you're going to end up getting it in paper, the only thing you're doing is increasing your, uh, adding more uh, steps to your business process. It would yep. be easier. And I've, I've been engaged with a couple of JPs in Dallas County while we don't, have well, we haven't implemented the case management system for our criminal courts and JP courts. We do have a countywide document management system, so they are taking advantage. We use the mainframe for our index data, and they use the um, document management system for the um, for their new electronic the new electronic version of their paper files. Right. So they're just using the tools that you already have in place to yeah. to better their business processes, which I would imagine we would see a lot of that. And the again, the issue is in the smaller counties. Um, they don't have a they don't have an old mainframe that, with a document management system that they can use on it. So there may be other, and there are definitely other ways and other processes that are electronically that are electronic that they could be using, uh, depending on the county and and what's available out there. Yeah. And so Casey, let me ask you. So what's a, and I would we, we need to move on, but what's the percentage of um, counties that reach out to you all as it relates to um, making recommendations on on uh, efficiency, so to speak, or make a recommendation on uh, new business processes uh, that are better than the ones that they're using? I would have to check with our research and court services, but we have a whole division and uh, we, uh, we have a uh, former district clerk who heads up that effort and, and she would know 
the number of counties that reach out, but we do have a person on staff that mm -hmm. um, county clerks and judges can reach out to, to say, Hey, you know, I'm having an issue with this, or I think we can improve our process. Can you help me? What are other counties mm -hmm. doing? And so she facilitates that. Okay. All right. And uh, I think we'll end uh, just with a, a research update. Uh, we continue to see uh, the user community uh, increase, although it, it, it has slowed uh, quite a bit since, uh, you know, since what we've seen. Um, it's, it's gone up about 5% uh, since the last time that we've met. We continue to hear uh, uh, some feedback from the legal professional community specifically around um, you know, when are we going to get criminal data and then when are judgments and orders going to get in? Those are the two main topics that, that we hear from, from that community. Um, and, I, and I know we've, we've talked about that in the past. Uh, I do think that the user community will increase with some of the upcoming integrations that we've got uh, on track with Bear County, uh, Travis County, and Polk County. Uh, Bear is, is currently in an implementation model with their case management system. And I believe we're targeting around July to get that uh, integrated once they go live with their system. Travis is waiting for a CMS update. Uh, so I think they're in a similar pattern before we uh, get them engaged. And Polk uh, is an interesting one because they, uh, I, I believe they're at about a population of about 49,000, uh, which I think is a good indicator that, uh, you know, any, any size county in terms of population is, can, can integrate with research. And I know we've been uh, working predominantly with the uh, more uh, larger urban areas with the, with the high population, but uh, that's a good indicator that even some of the smaller ones can integrate, uh, which, is, which is, I think, a good step forward for us. So um, that's the update with uh, Research Texas, as well as the eFile Texas 1.0 update. And Terry, on this slide, just to confirm, when we have counties that do leverage that integration, they are exposing them at that point, then their judgments and orders are exposed to research to where for those counties, so like in Bear County, once they're integrated, we could go on and look at judgment and orders and cases in Bear County. That's right. Yeah, it, it, it opens up and it expands out the, um, the records because it does include those records that don't necessarily come through the e-filing system. And right. since those judgments and orders are generated by the court, that would fall into that, to that um, arena. So yeah, we would have access to those as well as any SRL filings that may be filed over the counter. And that, uh, that, that just opens it up to a broader set of records, which is more attractive to that legal professional community. Absolutely. T Terry, um, I have a question. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, it, it appears here that, that there's um, the increase certainly for 2021 is primarily not among attorneys. I mean, there is a bump in attorneys that's significant. And there's a bump that's significant with regard to judges, which is great. Um, but do you all have any more breakdown of, of what the registered users who are not attorneys are? Um, is that something that one y'all have? Um, and second, anything that you, you, you know, any, any, any insights to draw from that? Who's using it? Yeah, it's a, a, a good question, Carlos. Um, you know, I'd have to dig into the details to see. I don't have it at, at, at my fingertips here. I do, I do know that a large portion of the registered users are generally legal professionals who just aren't attorneys, so paralegals and legal assistants and things like that that are, that are helping um, the attorneys prepare and get ready and, and maybe even just continue to their operations. So I, I, I do know that that's uh, that's a large portion of that community. I don't have the breakdown, but I, I can tell you that that uh, trend is is consistent across the other states in which we have this product available, and that the the legal professionals that are not attorneys are generally the the largest user community, but but most do fall within that legal professional community still. All right. Any other questions for Terry? Well, you guys are, are quiet on e-file one today. That's good. Just uh, I get I guess just for us, just on the clerk side, uh, we're still looking for the new version of the EFM, so we yeah, get we'll, it off of Silverlight. Yeah, we'll talk about that on the next agenda item because that's e-file two. So, Casey, this is Dennis. Uh, one of the things that we've discussed previously, but we haven't really discussed in a while, is the revenue from the Research Texas. 
I, I know there was some discussion way back when, and I remember my first meeting with this committee, um, having a pacer-like system was something we talked about at, at almost a decade ago. And there was a lot of concern about that. Are we satisfied that the revenue model's working well? Is I guess, what do, you, what do you mean by satisfied? I know that <laughs> when, when documents are sold, that, that money goes to the county and right. we, could, I, we could certainly get Tyler to give us an update on how much that is and who's gotten what as far as money is concerned. Is that, I, as really far agree. as being satisfied, I'm, I'm sure Tracy would, would like to answer that question. I'm sure some of the local jurisdictions, but we made some, we made some um, estimates at the outset, that there would be some revenue that would be distributed and overall yes. the number of documents that were provided to the public has gone up. I think that that, I don't know that we had good numbers before, but I hope that that's a good thing. I just wanted to make sure that the revenue was along the projections we thought they would be going. When yeah, we uh, we'll, I'll get Tyler to get us the current um, revenue that's going on so that we can um, see where that stands against what we predicted when we started, you know, three years ago. Yeah, okay. I can, I can pull that information and, and provide it to this, this group for sure. I, I, I can tell you that, um, you know, the, the majority of the documents that uh, the user community is, is searching for are those judgments and orders. And so the integration is key to that. I, I, obviously the more that we have integrated, the more, those documents are available. And I think you'll see that be a big trigger. Um, what we could also do is, is share with uh, this group, those that are integrated and what their document sales look like versus those who aren't and uh, get a comparison there. And I think that would be a, a, a good indicator of that. Okay. I, th I think that would be helpful maybe for our next meeting to have a discussion um, just about that, to take a, a deeper dive into um, how that is looking and, um, and I look forward to hearing a little bit on the, from the orders committee on where we are on, on kind of moving ahead on if we have to have an option other than integration, right, clearly for these orders and judgments. So, um, you know, hopefully we can talk later on in the meeting about that. All right, any other questions for Terry? Uh, and he'll be back for e-file too, because he'll, he'll tag along. So Terry, then uh, you can go ahead and unshare your screen. Or do I have to kick you off? I may have to kick you off. Here at law, I'll kick you off. Did that work? Yep. Okay, great. Sorry, I was trying to find the right button. Okay, I'm gonna try a trick that I, I uh, saw from my good friend at uh, Judge Ferguson. So next up now you can see see me in the Twitch mode and you can see we're gonna talk about e-file 2.0. So I, I credit uh, Judge Ferguson for this trick. I saw him do it at Judicial Council and thought to myself, that's really slick. How did he do that? And then I realized, oh, there's an advanced tab in virtual backgrounds. So I was, I was impressed, Judge Ferguson, for a little bit until I saw, oh, he just, he saw the extra feature. That's awesome. Um, so anyway, let's talk a little bit about eFile 2.0. Um, what we're going to talk about quickly, and then we do have uh, Terry here for questions, um, is some of the components um, that we've got. Uh, with the system, uh, what we did to procure it. And then we'll talk about the phased improvements that are scheduled for e-file two. That does include um, getting rid of the silver light uh, piece as well as a new uh, EFSP and some other really useful tools. And then we'll talk about timelines, uh, to some of that, and then Terry can answer questions. Um, just so that everybody is aware, also on the meeting, if you scroll through, you'll see um, Evan Acosta is here at the meeting as well. Evan's with Tyler Technologies and he's the project manager on the Tyler side. Um, you'll also see Sam Lavario. Sam is with OCA and he's the project manager on the OCA side. 
And so Terry and I generally take the program kind of role and we let Sam and Evan roll forward with uh, keeping the project going, keeping things on track. Um, as you guys know, this is our e-filing system as it is today. And um, the way uh, we procured it, it's gonna stay the same uh, generally moving forward. So you remember the last time there was a big question on do we stay with the EFSP model or do we get rid of the EFSP model? And we ultimately decided to stay. And that is actually, as we've seen, has worked well with innovation. And we've got several that um, have grabbed a niche market to be able to do different things with uh, attorneys, which is great. So the way we procured it, um, we actually this time around went with Gartner to get um, the requirements for the e-filing system and take a little bit deeper dive into what we wanted the system to do. And so um, they facilitated with several subject matter experts that were not at OCA. We borrowed heavily from JCIT and the clerks um, and some of the attorney pools that we have to make sure that we got uh, things in the system, in the new version of e-file um, queued up and ready to go. Uh, we put the RFO out for bid in April of last year and got the responses back in June of last year. And then in September, the evaluation team that was put together um, recommended to negotiate. And then we signed the, the contract with Tyler um, on uh, the day before Christmas, actually. So some of the overarching changes, and these are, I call these overarching tech changes. So since we're all on the technology committee, I figured I can, I can use a little bit of tech language and acronyms. Uh, this project definitely has a heavier project management load because it is a major information resource project from the state's perspective because we're, the amount of money that we're spending and the amount of time that it's going to take to do the, the timeline for the project. Um, also with this, you'll recall um, when we, for those of you that were with us when the switch from Texas.gov over to Tyler for the first time, um, the timeline was very short, and um, I would say that we were under a state of duress just because Texas.gov said we want to get out now, and then they kept shortening the amount of time that we had um, to get out. And so this time around, we do have much stronger SLAs with Tyler so that um, there's a whole, I want to say it's two pages of, of an Excel document that says this is, this is how we're going to gauge system performance and, um, and what happens when the system isn't performing the way that we want it to perform. Uh, one of the other tech things that's going to happen through this process is that Tyler's moving everything from the Tyler Control Data Center, uh, which they've got one in Dallas and one up in Maine, and they'll be moving it over to AWS so that they can get uh, better administrative tools that they don't have at the data center. Um, that'll also give them better elasticity so that as volume goes up, we can, uh, they could just add servers and add work um, project products to that. Um, AWS also has uh, some good security tools that they'll be using out there as well. Um, another thing that we'll be doing is moving from ECF4 to ECF5. Um, you may recall when we went e-filing the first time and we were at ECF4 that uh, we had to do ECF-4 with Texas extensions because there was a lot of stuff missing out of ECF-4, things like payment information that didn't exist in that data model. Um, so during the- Casey, yes. Casey, I'm looking at this slide and it makes no sense to me. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> so can you move out of your tech mode? Yes. Um, and then tell us what the changes are for the end user, excellent. Yes. And yeah. what no, that was my next slide. Thank you, um, thank you. So for the tech folks, I'll send you that other slide so you can read the rest. So one of the overarching end user changes will we'll have a new review tool, which will be the removal of Silverlight. Um, the current review tool is limited to, I believe, Internet Explorer. And so that's kind of hampering a lot of our clerks. And so they want to use, be able to use Chrome and Edge and, and this new review tool works that way. Um, we've also already deployed the new filer tool that eliminates the, the 
old, old tool for filers to use, and then the H5 tool. So there's currently three state EFSPs out there running, and we're already starting the process of moving the oldest two to the newest version. Um, last meeting, uh, Miles had said there were some performance issues, and Tyler saw those and, and eliminated those so that that should be running better. And um, we'll talk a little bit about too about e-filing insights. This is uh, what I would lovingly call the Blake Hawthorne Memorial uh, Data Dashboard. Um, it's got a lot of interesting uh, data that's useful for clerks, useful for court administrators. Um, that, that we've already seen a quick demo of it, and I would say it's more than 50% completed. And she was actually using data from our current e-filing system that it was very neat to be able to have a business intelligence sitting on top of it. Um, one of the requirements has us reworking the return for correction process for the filers, because right now when a, a clerk returns a filing for correction, the filer has to make a copy of it and then resend it. And so we're gonna rework that process to make it a little bit more streamlined for the filers. Um, we're gonna rework the proposed order process. And that's mainly because we see people using it in different ways. And so we wanna make that more uh, streamlined and more consistent from everybody. We'll be adding uh, the ability for filers to file things in bulk. So like if you have a vacation letter that you need to file on 15 different cases, instead of doing 15 different filings, you can do it all in one shot. And then on the back end for the clerks, uh, bulk acceptance or bulk return for correction so that you don't have to do things one at a time. You can shuffle things through a little bit quicker. And then finally, um, local configuration control, there's gonna be more of a focus to allow the um, local jurisdictions to make changes to, the, to their part of their jurisdiction directly. Uh, today, if um, they have any kind of a change, usually they'll need to go to Tyler to get that change done. And this way um, we'll be enabling controls so that they can make some of those changes themselves without having to go to Tyler, which I think will be a little bit helpful. So this is a, a quick screenshot of the new filer portal. Um, it's the real one's got our branding on it, but you'll notice that the trade dress is starting to look a lot like research. So they've adopted that kind of research style look and um, have it set up. Uh, we we're working with them to go to make a two way street so that you can, if you're in e-file and you want to know all the documents that are on this case, you can click a button and get taken to research and see all the documents in that case. And they've already got the other way around to where if you're in research and you want to file something into a case that you can click a button and then be taken over to e-filing to file things into that case. Um, this is a quick screenshot of the uh, new reviewer portal. And so um, we saw a development uh, piece of this and then uh, this, I believe, and Terry, correct me if I'm wrong, we're looking at going live with this in the September timeframe. And so we're working with Tyler to, to plan out the planning because this is a completely different look and feel for our clerks. And so we'll be wrapping around training and webinars and all that other good stuff um, to prepare clerks and clerks offices for this transition because this looks, it functionally does the same thing, but it's it's a very different look and feel uh, from what they're used to today. And then this is a quick shot of uh, e-filing insights. Um, so you'll, you'll recognize these kinds of things and I apologize for the screen being small, but you can kind of tell uh, this is their person just picking random different metrics that uh, they want to be able to track or that they were tracking. And um, we see several different dashboards coming across, one for like court administrators. So for like David in his role as the state court administrator, he wants to know how many new cases by case type there are going on across the state. He can see that here. Um, but if I'm a clerk, I wanna know 
How fast are my clerks accepting envelopes? What percentage are being returned? I may want to know what kind of cases um, are coming in. Um, you'll notice um, right up here, there's a uh, 575 returned. And as a clerk, you know, we were talking about with them that it would be very valuable for you to be able to go in and look to see who on your staff is returning them, what are they being returned for, um, who are you returning them to, is there a training issue at a law firm that, that the clerk's office needs to address, and um, it's got all these features to where, where we at JCIT can say this is what the, the standard dashboard looks like, um, but then at the same time the clerks and each individual user can arrange what these look like and arrange these things. You'll notice also on um, some of them up at the top, there's a little green flag and a little red flag. Um, Tyler has said that there we have the ability, and I think right now it's global, but it may be at the local level too, to where you can say establish a standard. And so if you're on track with the statewide standard, you can put a little flag up there that says this is on track or if you go outside of the bounds of, of what's expected, you can have a little red flag to say, you know, hey, you need to look at this because there's something going on. And so we're really excited because A, the, the filer portal is already out there and so we're starting to move people over to it. The Silverlight one is, is um, about to go into tests so that we can, the Silverlight eliminating review tool is on its way out. And then this is at least 50% done and we'll probably start piloting it with a couple of clerks uh, within the next few months and then start rolling it out. Um, I'm ready. Along. That was me, Casey. I said, I'm ready. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah we, you are, want it? We, we are too, because our IT, the central IT for all Harris County is wanting everyone off of IE. Off of what? They're they're trying to stop it completely off the domain. So <laughs> we got to get off of IE. Yeah. Internet Explorer. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, I agree. Um, as someone who administers the domain, I agree that stuff is a pain in the rear to to deal with. So okay, so John and Tracy, y'all are y'all were kind of autom automatically on the list, as was every clerk on JCIT of being mm -hmm. in the quote unquote pilot group for this, because you of all people would know. Uh, what's important. And again, when we start this and you see this and don't, we take no offense if you say this is useless, I want this instead. Um, the person that's doing the development is um, familiar with business intelligence and how to do all that stuff, but is fairly new to the court world. So they're taking it from what they think. Uh, but with you guys in the real world aspect, it's a, it's a much better uh, thing. And then finally, a little bit of the timeline. And I think um, here, let me slide over to the left. And that way you can see the, the timing of it. Um, so um, Tyler is tackling this in four different phases. And so phase one has already been kicked off. And it's uh, with the e-filing insights, moving to ECF5, uh, clerk review, bulk review, and, and the clerk activity stuff will be uh, starting to implement soon and will be done by next June. Um, phase two is starting development this July and goes through Christmas of the following year and there'll be more filing tool enhancements. Uh, we'll have the reworked return for correction. Um, the other thing we're looking forward to, Tracy, is document check at submission so that we can reduce the number of filings that end up in court, the court error queues that they get checked for standards at the front rather than at the time of stamping. Um, security enhancements are kind of going along the whole way. Uh, phase three, we have bulk filing. We're talking about automatic citations, but as we dig into that, that may look a little different. Uh, reworking proposed orders, priority routing, uh, filers being able to belong to multiple firms. We had talked about that before. You may have an attorney that works for v &E during the daytime, but does pro bono work at nighttime for a legal aid group. And they want to be able to keep their filings separate in their two different attorney hats. Um, so we'll allow that. And then phase four, um, more configuration control that OCA can do, more configuration control that the clerks can do. 
uh, more firm reporting, enhanced for firm port reporting. And then the one that you see down at the bottom in gray is switch to texas.gov for payments. Uh, we're working with DIR and talking with texas.gov um, right after our initial meeting with them. Uh, as you guys recall, texas.gov, the payment side is run by NIC USA, our dear friends that were doing e-filing the first time around. And so I went into that meeting with my initial concerns that I had from the last time we dealt with NIC USA and just to make sure that we're not going to run into that again. And then right before the meeting, Nick USA became Tyler Technologies presents Nick USA. And so Tyler's in the process of buying them right now. And so talking with DIR, we came to an agreement that we wanted to wait a couple of months because it may be that um, we don't do the switch to Texas.gov and we use the existing payment system that we have today. Um, I can tell you that when we talk about switching to Texas.gov for payments, that is a whole lot of pain for everybody because their initial ask was, well, we need to get bank letters from all 450 some odd clerk's offices so that we can set them up with new merchant IDs and all this other stuff. It's like, whoa, this is something that uh, we may not want to embark on. So with that, that's the end of uh, my slides. And I will uh, ask Terry and to be on for questions. Do you, you all have any questions? Okay, well, I've got one I'll start with. In the standards committee, we discussed non-paper filings. Um, we know it's already an issue on the criminal side to you know, take in video forms, but um, on the civil side, sometimes you have exhibits and things that are non-paper. I, I know we talked about that as an enhancement at some point, but I, I was curious if that's something that y'all have part of the plan for this new version, or is that an enhancement that's going to be added later also? And, and when you say non-paper, you mean digital non-paper? Yeah. Like, obviously, we can't put, like, knives and things through. Right, I'm really talking about video evidence. or audio, right. but I. So, Terry, I'll let you speak to that, but I do, or Evan, one of the two of you, I do believe that the system allows us to put other file formats through it if we so chose. Is that correct? That's that's right. There's um, there's a couple of things to, to think about, and and primarily it's around um, the intake process because the system can trans transmit any kind of uh, document type or a file type. Not just not document type, file type, audio, video, PDF, whatever it is that we want. Um, it it allows for that, but it's really on the receiving end from the CMS. If the CMS can accept that. That's, that's one uh, potential barrier. And then number two is the file size limitation. If it gets too big, then um, obviously that increases storage space um, on, the, on the clerk side and then can also lead to um, you know, very long wait times if that file is, is, is very large in size. But the system can handle it today. There just needs to be some, um, maybe some technology standards around it and then validation and confirmation that the CMS can can receive those files. Right. Casey, this is just a quick yes or no question. When you were in that PowerPoint, did you think you were in the matrix? Just to just want to know. No, was, I don't. But I really saw Judge Ferguson that. do it, and I was like, "That is really cool. I got to try that." So. So, cool. so I'm just going to ask a question and that is I know that there's different files for evidence and things like that my recollection is both I think the rules prohibit certain kinds of embedded media and stuff like that at this time right because uh, we don't want a bunch of video necessarily that's great for evidence to present but in terms of having it to, attached to your pleading I think there's some limitations on a lot of that stuff right now. I mean, just in terms of the rules. So we would also need to, I think, look at that. That's my recollection. And I, I just haven't pulled up the rules recently. So yeah, I, and judge, I would agree that if, if there is a limitation, it's it's either on the, the side of the rules from a policy standpoint right. or on the side of the CMS, because I can I can imagine my phone ringing if all of a sudden 
somebody tried to file a, a five gig video to Tracy at her system and wanting to know why is it stopping all these other filings because we're trying to focus on this five gig file trying to come through. Casey, it's Miles. There's another issue that's always been in this, a separate path with Thames. The court reporters are having a living nightmare with your courts of appeals, clerks that are rejecting evidence that's been put into the courtroom. So Mark and I put a video in, in a case, whether it's in Bear County or Tarrant County, and depending on what court of appeal we draw, the uh, IT people at the Court of Appeal tell the court reporters that they have to convert the evidence because their IT staff can convert it, therefore it must be converted. And if you think I'm kidding on that, there's a civil case going on right now that came out of a criminal case where I'll probably end up having to hit the stand. Wow. So you're altering evidence. It's back to that discussion that we had years ago on this with, with Bob where if you have a shotgun that's collected at a crime scene, you cut off the stock and the barrel because your locker will only hold the middle part of the gun. Right. So Thames went off on a different direction on this whole standard for technology and what's admissible, admissible in the courtroom and up to the appellate courts. Not that it's gonna be solved today on this, but we may need to put this on a sidetrack for the technology, not to let it in in the clerk's office because it'll kill it. Five gigs is a small body worn 4K camera now. Right. All right. So five gigs is on the low end of what we're eating on servers. We've got to get this fixed in the state, though, when we really crank back up for trials. Or uh, I've got district judges calling over here asking for advice, and I don't have it. Yeah. So, Miles, I'll just offer something, and this is changing, I know, but at one time when money went out to the police departments and everything to just go buy, some cameras or, or the, the 7-Elevens bought cameras or whatever, they all, some of them had proprietary um, uh, software to them yes, such that I can tell you, we got stuff up on the fourth court many years ago. So this possibly has changed and the conversion may not be difficult, but there was no way for the appellate judges to see the evidence. There, we didn't have a player that could play or anything that could do to look at the, the evidence and had to go back to the trial court and try and figure out how we could view stuff. Um, now, hopefully that has changed um, as technology has gotten better over the years and maybe people have upgraded, but I know that that was a problem at one time. And um, you know, I, I don't know if it's a current one. It is, that's why our forensic lab stays very busy in our office each week. Uh, there's government generated videos we could control. So the body warns, the stuff that the government purchases, we could put limitations on that. And we have through things like DIR or how the NIJ does grants, the mom and pop videos from the systems that they bought at Sam's or Costco. Those are hard. Those are usually Chinese knockoffs that have some proprietary value to them that you have to get past. But whether it's that or the body warns or a confession that goes for three hours in the homicide unit, the TAME system is putting limitations on the upload on the back end. And it's putting the pressure on the clerks, the uh, court reporters for how they cut it. So it, I, I apologize, but that's a hot button issue up here in the second court right now is if their IT person can do it, then we're expected to do it. I saw Judge Ferguson nodding his head earlier on this. The judges get it at the district, at the trial court level because they hear it from their court reporters. It's just something I think as a group we probably need to look at and make sure we don't kill the clerks like we're killing the court reporters with uh, the appellate courts. Careful what we upload and what we allow. Well, this is something that we, I think we can address in part through judicial education. Uh, when we first went digital in our court, I, I passed a standing order for the pandemic purposes for, for remote hearings. And one of the things that is required in our standing order is that no evidence can be uploaded into our system unless it fits the format that is acceptable to the Court of Appeals. And so they can't upload a video unless it's an MP4. Uh, they can't upload a document in doc format. It has to be in PDF or as a, as a, photo, a, a photograph, a, a graphic image. So I control that right up front because I had one time where my court reporter spent about 40 hours trying to convert a single video to get it accepted by the Court of Appeals. 
And so I, I think once courts realize that as the judge, you can control the format that is allowed to be uploaded into Box or, or your file management system, then we, we head that off at the pass. It hasn't been an issue for me in, in the entire pandemic because we reject the evidence when they try to upload it and tell them you can't upload an MOV file. You have to convert it to MP4. That's on you. It's your evidence. As the judge and the clerk, it's not ours. It's their job to get it in a format that's usable. So that, that may be something that uh, TCJ wants to take a look at and including in the education for judges going forward. I agree, Judge, it's for another day. The only problem is for the criminal side, that evidence in a capital case, when we're converting, we're losing, we're dropping pixels. What are we dropping and who's doing the conversion? So it's- That's a, it's the a, point though. You're also changing the evidence. And when it comes up to the Court of Criminal Appeals, it's not the original evidence. That's, that's right. The problem. lawyers have to convert it before they upload it for use at trial. It has to be their exhibit in a format that the that the court, the higher courts will accept. But if this is coming, say it, say the original tape is some security video from a a garage. If the lawyers change it, they're changing the evidence and they're changing the other side's ability to determine whether it was otherwise altered. Well, it doesn't change what gets turned over in discovery. It changes the format of the document. Um, it, it, I, would, I would liken it to uh, taking a graphic image and just changing it from JPG to PNG. You're, you're not changing the evidence because it's the appearance of what, what's on the page that matters. Um, if if they, if they didn't anything. turn over, the original version, which is something handled with ESI and, and digital discovery, but that would be an issue. And I think they would raise that issue uh, to the court, the defense would to challenge it. But insofar as the format of the item uh, that is used, um, I, I haven't seen anything that indicates that a change of format is changing the evidence itself. I'd be interested to see that. Casey, so, I, 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 I was going to say, Miles, if, if we should we should chat offline about it, because I can tell you from the tame side of things, we can we can we put the limit on what files and what file size can be uploaded. But those can all those are all configurable. Well, so it, the, the flip side of the, the concern is we obviously don't want uploading of executable files, their security concerns. If you buy a, a, a sure. Chinese knockoff from Costco, is that video, does that have a, a malware embedded inside the video that, that Kay, you're going Casey, to upload? It's, it's been about a decade since we came down and did, when we have a real meeting in person again, I'd be happy to bring the Forensic Lab Roadshow back down and show all the difference in what happens when we do convert a still image and where the pixels go and how it breaks the hash and then the videos and show that so everybody's on the same page. Yeah, cool. And then Mark, you had your hand up? Yeah, uh, in, as a practical matter, the courts, uh, at least in the jury trials I've been involved in so far and, and in Zoom trials, uh, are oftentimes having the exhibits uploaded to a uh, court's Google Drive or some other drive. What if you were to create a protocol whereby uh, the courts and the clerks were to change all that, of course, to view only and viewer download only, and then those were links uh, in the uploaded material. In other words, you were to allow links like we did when we first started doing digital briefs 15, 20 years ago. And, and then you could have a secure link and you would know that it was the original admitted file because it's in the, the district court's file, for example by link to their stored drive. And I think the only issue there, and this is just, all, and we'd, I'd wanna, we obviously wanna talk about it more, but um, I know not all counties have shared drives that are electronic that you can link to. And then my only other concern would be link rot. Uh, if you have a case that gets tried in trial court by the time it winds its way either to CCA or the Supreme Court, is that link gonna still be valid further on while the case is still active. And then what if it's a, and 
what if it's like one of those cases that you have to keep forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, then will that link be good 30 years down the road and who's paying for the storage and all that other good stuff? Well, I, I wasn't proposing that we add this. I thought maybe there was some discussion about whether alternate formats. Today, the standards, I think this committee's adopted and proposed limits us to PDF formats or documents that work with it and non-blemish PDFs. But we had talked at one point about including alternate file formats based on the discussion. And, and Miles is right that when you convert things, you, you create new evidence. There's a lot of concern about that, particularly in the federal courts. I, I'm proposing that we take that out of the 2.0 discussion. I didn't mean to suggest it should be part of it. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't there and we hadn't considered those standards yet. Right. Um, and, so, uh, Dennis, I, I like the move of kicking it over to the standards committee as a topic for them to, to discuss. Um, but I'll tell you from uh, e-file 2.0 and from TAME's report submission, it's a configuration item. We can set it to whatever we want. So if the standards committee says, allow this, this, and this, and allow it up to this size, we can do that on all systems and tell the district tell the district clerks that, uh, to get ready for it because it's coming in. I, I would also add, working for a defense firm, we keep all of our evidence way past judgments. Now, most of our work is in federal courts. I would presume plaintiffs and defense counsel would keep all of their evidence but the filings and the evidence presented in trial, obviously the court's gonna wanna hand up to the next level, but I think the lawyers also are gonna keep a lot of that stuff to avoid the link rot problem you're talking about, Casey. I, I personally know we've got some 20 year old files from cases in the 90s uh, that I have to maintain because there may be an issue at some point. Just, just make sure that anything that the standards committee comes up with either complies with the current e-filing rules or you also suggest changes to those e-filing rules passed by the high courts, or you're gonna run afoul of those regardless of what you do. So make sure you include those when you're talking about standards. And I would imagine C on two, we'd wanna consider both the rules of civil procedure and the trap as well. Yes. There, there's an archiving component to this on the court side as well, though, that you have to, to think about, um, which is why the federal courts use the PDFA as their standard. Okay, let's move on. And, and um, Miles, I think it would be a good idea for you to maybe when we go live with our next meeting to have a presentation on this, because this is something worthwhile. I like, you know, Mark Unger's ideas really, you know, moving into the future. And, uh, but I also understand the concerns there, but we do need to deal with some of the standards, I'm sure. And I'm sorry that this is devolving onto the, the court reporters. I didn't realize that. I really like the solution of the lawyers are in charge of their evidence or what they're gonna put on. And they need to make sure that the appellate courts can access that if they want an appeal and wanna rely on it. So, um, so let's table that for the next um, meeting. And uh, let's see where we are on our agenda. Okay, so anybody else? That was one question that opened up a lot of conversation. Other people have I, conversations about um, e got, Texas 2.0? I got one question. So Casey, you were saying that uh, Tyler was looking at buying uh, NIC. They, so they, they bought would be NIC. The, huh? Not looking at buying. The sale is in process of being executed. Okay, so they would be the bank? basically yes. for e-filing? Yes, well, much like they are, much like they use Chase Payment Tech today, I imagine they would, like NIC, NIC farms it out to a different group other than Chase Payment Tech. I think they're on like Global World Pay, which is a competitor. Okay, and so all of Texas.gov would be behind the scenes Chase Bank. So there wouldn't need, there wouldn't be a need for bank letters and- Right, and that, that's what we're trying to do card. is- is work with DIR even in, in the event that that NIC re becomes just basically NIC powered by Tyler Tech, that you know it could be in the future that we can go with DIR and say, look, 
you contracted with Tyler Technologies to do Texas.gov and we're using the Tyler Technologies payment engine. Can we just stay on the one that we have so that we don't have to go through this pain of redoing, uh, you know, reconciliation, which is already a pain as it is, and right. bank letters and all this other mess that we worked so hard to set up over the last decade. Right. Okay. Thank you. Hey, see that that um that transaction finalized on Monday, so it's oh, official good. now, and we got past the SEC um, stuff that we needed to. So uh, I just yesterday afternoon got the contact from. Uh, NIC that is that is responsible for the payment processing, but I haven't had a chance to connect with them. So uh, okay, we'll cool. talk, we'll connect, and then um, yeah. circle back around. Excellent. So see that that's great news. So now it is officially Tyler Tech presents NIC USA. All right. Um, Good luck, Terry. <laughs> DIR is counting on you too, Terry. Okay. Any other questions for e-file two? All right, hearing none. So judge, if you'll indulge me, I'm gonna take item C, UCMS, and then item E, because both of them are um, very short, and then we can devote time to item D, which is a little bit longer. Okay, uh, so do, okay do, do you or Bob want to take the, the case management system? Are you gonna take that? I'll take that. Okay. Because yeah, we're All in right. the middle of it. Okay. Um, so the update that you guys uh, may uh, remember from our last meeting, uh, OCA has been tasked, tasked with putting together uni the uniform case management system. And this is uh, to provide an option to the counties that have 20,000 or less um, in population, a standardized case management system. Part of the requirements is that it needs to be fully integrated with eFile Texas research. Um, do the daily batch uploading to DPS, not the entry, and to be able to do the batch uploads to the monthly reports uh, from OCA so that we can get data in a more timely manner. Um, that RFO went out, came back. Uh, the evaluation committee since our last meeting has met and made recommendations to OCA, and OCA is, is progressing on the timeline uh, that we anticipate, and right now we're still showing that uh, we'll have signed contracts with up to three vendors to do this uh, by the end of May or, or early June. And so then after that, you'll see us um, starting to communicate with clerks to see if there are anybody that's interested in that. And this system is would be wholly paid for by OCA so um, in the state so that if you have a, a county that's rural and they don't have a good case management system or it's one that they're not satisfied with how it's performing, um, then we can provide them up to three options at no cost to them to convert to and move towards uh, for that. Part of the, that will be establishing like a Texas baseline configuration for case management. And so we're working with that project to, to flesh out what those roles are and what, if anything, we need from the standards committee to, to say, you know, this is how the statewide case management system should look. Um, especially when we're talking of up to three vendors, it may be configurations done in a way that, that they're general enough that we can tell multiple people do it this way and still be okay with it. Um, so hopefully by our next meeting, um, I'll have a lot more to tell you about UCMS, but that's all I can talk about right now. Then quickly judge if you're okay to take letter E orders in research. Uh, that subcommittee. So that committee met and then we circulated around and right now we have a survey that's ready to go out to the clerks. Um, if Carlos is and uh, I believe Carlos and Todd are the co-chairs of that are okay with it. Um, then um, what that survey does is basically when the committee met, the, the discussion was around what you had said, Justice Simmons, that we do need to give an option besides mm -hmm. Um, being fully integrated uh, for those clerks uh, to get orders into the system. And so this survey asks basically the clerks, what's your current process for, for getting orders from the judge into your system? Are you putting it in your system? Are you using paper like a basket and a clerk, or is it coming across through a tool or electronically? 
And so, Casey, can you put that survey up? Can you sh uh, screen share that? Do you have it available right there with you? I think I do. Hold on just a second. And that might be, I, I think that'd be of interest maybe to everybody just to see yeah, what sure. the survey looks like. All right, here we go. And this one, since it's a web page, it won't let me do the whole uh, Twitch thing. Okay. So I'll be in a square. Um, so this is the survey that talks about how orders work today in your office. Um, we talk about how do orders come in from your litigants? Do they come in through e-file? Are they coming in through um, paper in the mail? Are they coming in directly to the judge? And so that we can capture the percentages of things that we can tell how are orders coming in um, to the court? Uh, asking how the judge gets access to the proposed orders, because we know that some it's via paper, some people print them off, sometimes the judge prints them off, sometimes they go into the CMS and get them. There's all sorts of different ways that that happens. Um, how does the judge return orders? And um, how does it come back from the judge? We know that some do it through e-files, some do it through their CMS, some do it through a tool, some email it, some mark up a piece of paper, stick it in a basket and get it picked up by the end of the day. And then asking them, how do they get orders to out to the parties today once they're signed? There's different ways that they do that. And then how do, how do the public today get copies of those orders? And then we have another section talk about talking about orders available to the public. If you don't provide them um, electronically today, what's the what is the main barrier that you have as a, as a clerk's office in getting getting those out and available to people? And then at the end, we ask you know your basic demographic questions about the clerk. And so it's a fairly short survey that just kind of goes through. Um, the process of, of how orders work from, from the time they show up at the court to the time they leave the court from proposed over to being either an order or just a piece of paper that the judge won't sign. And so with that, um, the committee proposes to go ahead and put that survey out to the clerk so that we can get that information and then we'll be meeting again once we get good survey answers um, to kind of look at making recommendations on what we need to do um, beyond that and how we can get those orders in on research. So Carlos, do you wanna give us an, uh, any other insights you have on the committee, you or Todd? I'd, I'd defer to Todd, but I don't, I don't think, I think the survey looks good and ready to go unless, you know, Todd has some other I don't. I think, uh, you know, Casey deserves praise as usual for artfully putting together that survey and uh, with very little input from me or Carlos. And so I, I would say let's get it out the door and see what we get back and then meet again and see uh, where we are, and hopefully be able to advance the ball on this issue. Okay. Yeah, so I think having the, once we have the information of how things are actually being done, that will help give us the guidelines to get it where more of the orders get put online, which is obviously the goal. Okay, so yeah, so let's go ahead um, and get those out to the clerks and hope we get a pretty good response um, from them so that we at least have this kind of basic data that we can kind of look at and guide us um, and guide your committee, Carlos and Todd, through um, kind of your next steps. All right, so then the, the last item is um, the uh, Cyber JCIT Security. Cybersecurity Subcommittee. Yeah. And I'll turn it over to Judge Hind because Judge Hind and Dennis, that committee has actually been very active. We've met several times since our last meeting and there's always a good open dialogue. And I don't know if it's just Judge Hind, Dennis and I nerding out on cybersecurity, but we do a lot of that back and forth of like, hey, did y'all see this? Hey, look at who got hit today, or hey, what about this? Um, so it's an active group. So Judge Hind, I'll turn it over to you. And whatever you want, Judge, shown on the screen, let me know and I'll pop it up on the screen okay. for you. Thanks, Casey. And well, uh, 
uh, as I've uh, worked on this committee, I've become increasingly paranoid, um, which is probably in some ways a good habit for cybersecurity, but who doggy the stuff that's out there. And I, I don't have the sophisticated um, uh, technology background that Dennis and Casey have. So I can just, when Dennis says something scary, then I know I really need to be afraid. And uh, so uh, it's been great working with them. We've got a great committee, uh, you know, with uh, Tracy and Cynthia and John and uh, it, it has been a good dialogue. I think we've come up with some, oh, and Ed also, sorry, Ed, uh, some good thoughts. Um, Tracy's shared some things that she's found on training and, and such uh, that's kind of raised all of our eyebrows, um, which means that um, as, as with cybersecurity, it's always a work in process. You never get to say, we're done. Uh, we're, we're secure cyber-wise. Uh, and so, um, you know, what we've tried to do at the outset is try to kind of get just a basic understanding of where we are at with cybersecurity, mainly at the trial court levels. You know, DIR and OCA can really provide a lot of that, um, the uh, support and, and protection for the courts of appeals and the Supreme Court and the Court of Criminal Appeals. So it's really uh, down at the local level where, uh, you know, we feel like in terms of uh, cybersecurity, we can uh, really provide a value add. And so one of the things we did uh, was just basically send out a survey to the, um, to the clerks to get a sense of how generally IT is handled at the local level. Um, who is responsible for auditing and who has incident response plans. Uh, you know, uh, one of the nuances that uh, I think some people were unaware of, uh, just because I used to be a district judge, I knew this, but, you know, the auditor is appointed by the district court and the, for each county. And so in a sense, uh, the district judges have a little bit more influence over auditing for cybersecurity potentially than we might ordinarily think. And so there might be some areas where we can provide some guidance to the district judges. Um, you know, are the county auditors auditing for cybersecurity? Should they be when you're appointing an auditor? Uh, are you getting pushback from the county about this? Is the county doing its own auditing? If they are doing the auditing, <laughs> Uh, is it really an independent audit or is it uh, just kind of rubber stamping stuff? And so getting an initial understanding of who's handling cybersecurity auditing and so forth was one of the things we wanted to do. So we, we put together a survey. Uh, Casey's got the results uh, and uh, we'll go through those results real quickly and then kind of use those as a launching point on putting together a more um, uh robust set of recommendations for JCIT to consider recommending to the Supreme Court and the Court of Criminal Appeals and how to um, uh, provide guidance to the lower courts. So I'm going to hand it back over to Casey to talk about what we learned. Thank you, Judge. So we did send out a survey. We did get uh, 133 responses to this. And so we'll go through these results. Um, when we went through this with the committee, we found a lot of stuff that we suspected that we knew, but this was scary confirmation that, yes, that we weren't crazy, that what we knew was true. Um, so we talked about first about who provides technology services to the clerks and the courts, and it's predominantly either county IT or contracted IT. This is important to remember because this means that um, the courts at the, at the uh, district and county level are fighting with other county departments for IT services. So it's very rare that you have um, these eight who have clerk staff or specific court IT departments. That's extremely rare. Um, again, those these two chunks will come into play when we talk about business continuity and disaster recovery later on. Uh, we asked who I operates the cybersecurity uh, program for the clerk's office. And it's predominantly the county IT staff. 
uh, followed by, and this was kind of a surprise, third parties or vendors that operate cybersecurity programs um, at the clerk's office. And um, we saw other answers like uh, the county auditor, which was good. Uh, no one is kind of concerning. And then uh, the other, we'd have to drill down to those answers. Uh, who audits the cybersecurity program? Uh, the county IT staff do, uh, which is interesting because if that's who's running it, I would love to audit my own programs because I would pass that audit every single day. Um, and I would guarantee that because um, that's awesome because you control everything in the equation. Um, we did have some say that they do have third parties that do audits on their cybersecurity program, uh, which is good, but we only had eight people who have the county auditor that, that do that work. Uh, we asked which executive body is responsible for accepting the, your program risks and plans. And most everybody says the commissioner's court um, accept that, which is good because that means there's someone at the, the tippy top that knows here's what our cyber risks are and what our plans to mitigate them. And if we do have a risk, we can either accept it or give money to IT to go mitigate it or do nothing, but at least it's at that high level. Um, the second most popular answer was county IT staff, um, which is interesting because as a technologist, I want to I want you to be able to do whatever you need to do for your job, and I just want to tell you what the security risk is. And if you accept that, then that's on you and not on me. So having that kind of stuff um, in the IT shop is not necessarily good. Hey Casey, this is uh, John Warren. Um, as it relates to um, county IT staff, wouldn't those um, chief information officers be acting on behalf of the commissioner's court through their county administrator? You would hope so, but at the same time, if, if there is a security risk that's identified, who, who accepts that risk? Is it the IT director or, or the CIO, or is he or she taking that up to the county administrator and the commissioner's courts to say, we have this risk and here's how much it takes to fix it? You can either fix it or you can accept that that's a risk and continue on without fixing it. John, it's generally accepted that the executives over the organization on which the cybersecurity applies must be accountable and they have to be informed. Mm -hmm. I, I will say, in my experience, a lot of those executives don't want to be involved. It's far too technical. But if they mm -hmm. don't, then compliance becomes impossible. I can't tell yeah. the department heads, peers with me that they have to follow rules. They may just yeah. go off and do their own thing. Well, but um, uh, Dennis, I agree, but um, and I and I think the majority of those that um, well, some of them anyway. The, yeah, the majority of those and the uh, that the IT uh, staff is responsible. I think that's because most likely their uh, commissioners' court are, are, as you say, they they lack the technological understanding as it relates to the dynamics of cybersecurity. So they rely on their IT director. So, well, you figure it out. But is that IT director giving them an update? on what they have found and what um, uh, processes they, they propose to put in place. Because you, you're right, at the, at the end of the day, the question will, if something happens and if there's a ransomware or something else, the question will be asked, who's responsible and who, who was made aware? And who made the decision to use or, what, or use your security protocol or to not address the issue at all? Why, and, that and, that, and, that, and that ultimately goes back to the commissioner's court. So exactly. I, would, I would just say, if, if um, as it relates to county IT staff, the question would be, are these, are these individuals reporting their findings to the commissioner's court and making a recommendation? And is the commissioner's court acting on that recommendation? I agree. I agree. I agree. We're, we're going to have to, from the findings of the survey, we're, we're going to have to make some specific recommendations. Yeah. But um, in a minute, I'll try and cover why I think it's going to boil up all the way to the top in every county. Somebody yeah. at the top has to be responsible enough to say you got to mm -hmm. do it. Yeah. So the next question we had is your program certified or audited to a third party standard or organization? And the overwhelming answer was either know or don't know. 
um, which means that it, it may be likely that a lot of security programs out there are very ad hoc or have borrowed standards or pieces from different pieces, but it's not a standard. We then asked, do you have a cyber sec security incident response plan? And unfortunately the largest chunk from clerks was they don't know. Um, we, the next largest chunk, 31% said, yes, they do have one, which is good because then they know it exists and presumably would have read it um, or at least scanned it. And then uh, we had 16% that know that they don't have one. This one was really scary on a scale of one, one to 10, one being no way, no how, and 10 being absolutely. How would you rank your court's abilities? And I apologize, there should be an apostrophe after court's Quartz's ability to operate without a county provided technology, without county provided tech, as in no computers or no internet, could you operate? And the average score on a scale of one to 10 was a 3.04. So that, that indicates that without technology that most courts would not be able to operate at all. So that, that goes into thinking of uh, if there is a, a major cybersecurity incident, there is going to be an outage for a set amount, at least a set amount of time while investigations go on and restoration happens. Okay, so yeah. I think we saw an example of that uh, during the freeze with all the power outages with so much reliance on paperless systems today. That's what's going to happen, whether it's cybersecurity or some other interruption. Right, or any, any kind of disaster scenario. Absolutely, Ed. But at the at the same time, we if, if you have an automated system, you're required to have a manual backup in case the system goes down. Well, that's something that the incident response plan would address. Mm -hmm. if you have one and you've tested it, but for a lot of people, an outage of only a week is something that they would say, you know what, we're not going to start up all that. We'll just wait. But unfortunately, yeah. what we learned with the cyber incidents that occurred in Texas last year. A lot of organizations just stopped completely. And a cyber incident is one that doesn't thaw out after a week. Right. You got to rebuild everything. Right. We asked uh, who manages your accounts and permissions to case management and other, made, other automated court system. And uh, we had court clerk staff or court IT staff for the most case are managing their own permissions. We have two judges or senior judicial people. Um, second to the clerk staff or court IT is the county IT. Uh, we've got a group that's got vendors managing it well and then some others. We asked if when your office gets new equipment, who's responsible for building and loading the software on that equipment? And by far and away, it was county IT staff. Um, the other one that's half concerning is that it's a third party, such as, as a vendor, which means if you're not auditing that, you don't really know what they're putting on it or how they're managing it or anything like that. So that was a little concerning. And then we did get a good mix of district, county, and combos. Uh, clerks respond. And then we've got um, a good mix of, of rural to high-end um, counties. Uh, that responded to the survey and well. So that was our uh, very quick, easy cybersecurity that uh, Judge Hind and uh, Dennis can use to uh, forward the concepts that, that Judge Hind was talking about uh, to continue on down the road with the committee's work. Hey Casey, I, I, would like, I, I would like to add something as it relates to those um, third party vendors that are um, loading software onto uh, county computers. Uh, you know, uh, some years ago, there was a CJIS requirement that said that uh, anyone with a criminal record cannot have access to court, court information or court records. And so to what degree are they, the, uh, these counties that are allowing a third party vendor to um, do that work on their behalf? What's the vetting process to make sure, or are they aware of the CJIS requirements? I would, I wouldn't know, but I would bet that if, you've got a third party vendor loading software onto your computer by default, that you don't have an IT department, that IT is a thin slice of your normal daily job. So mm -hmm. I would imagine they don't know that those kinds of restrictions are in place. 
if it's not embedded in the contract, John, then the vendor's going to get away with whatever they can get away with. The yeah. idea is to use the same staff to serve as many different jurisdictions or organizations as they can. So, you know, they yeah. may have five guys supporting, you know, 17 different counties in the area. Uh, so that's important for that to be in the contract. I think when um, when Clark's associations and a lot of associations um, resume in-person meetings, I'm, I would recommend that uh, cybersecurity actually takes up 40% of one of those because of the dynamics of what we have to accomplish and the knowledge that um, a lot of clerks don't have as it, really, as it relates to those responsibilities. I think that's a great idea. Okay, uh, if we've got some time, I, I would like to kind of go over some of those concepts for this group, if that's appropriate for y'all now. Um, I put together some, some slides and some recommendations. Uh, my first comment is I know this is not an IT or information security group. And um, I'm gonna try and make this kind of a, a, a group of, of concepts that y'all can understand would be conveyed to the people who are responsible for developing these. But everyone on this call at some level is responsible for information security. And some of the terrifying stories I've read about recently make it clear that our soldiers are woefully unprepared and we need to arm all of our soldiers for the cybersecurity warfare that we're involved in. And my only other comment is if you, if you doze off, please don't comment that I'm a boring or radical. Um, Okay, so I need to uh, share my screen. Okay, I'm gonna make sure y'all can see the introduction to cybersecurity. Okay, I've just put together a few slides. I wanna cover some of the threats or the, the challenges that we're all facing and some of the news that's come out. All of these slides are available from Casey with some of my notes. They're really my speaking notes, but they include some of the hyperlinks. So y'all can follow up if you're interested. I'll try to make this quickly, but this is interactive. If you have any questions, feel free to break in. It's, it's better if I get questions as I go along. And I've, I'll, I'll try and make this uh, at least interesting to a certain point. Uh, just this year, uh, recently, Acer, who makes a lot of computers that we use, they also use uh, some uh, computers that you may remember from the old days. Uh, Packer Bell is part of Acer. They have some other brands that were common. I think they bought Gateway Computers. So a lot of the old brands that are out there are part of Acer. They were hit a couple of months ago with cyber, uh, cyber ransom, a ransomware attack, and the attackers demanded $50 million if Acer agreed to pay it before the middle of last month. If they didn't, they were asking for $100 million. Now, that was a record. No one had ever asked for that amount of money ever. And the attack was such that Acer won't publicly comment, and this is one of the problems with ransomware attacks, Companies will never share what they did or how they responded. But Acer won't comment. But it is highly likely that in addition to confidential information, which was released by the attackers, they also attacked and killed their backup process. It is highly likely that Acer was involved in this attack with the attackers to some extent. I don't know to what extent. They're still available. They make computers. But it wasn't just Acer. Just this month, one of Apple's primary contractors, a company called Quanta, was hit with a similar attack, and they also made a demand for 50 million. And in fact, to demonstrate the seriousness of their attack, the ransomware attackers disclosed public information or private information to the public about future Apple designs. Now, this is information that Apple doesn't want to get out. Obviously, Apple's not going to be able to sell a MacBook today if the public knows that the model available to them for a thousand bucks is gonna be replaced in two months with a similar design for a thousand bucks that has better features. It could cost Apple more than $50 million in sales. So that kind of information is incredibly um, valuable. And this is so new, we don't know how bad that attack was. Quanta is a, is a, is a I think it's a Chinese supplier, but they're overseas, they're not, they're not in the US. Apple was not hit, but one of their suppliers who they work closely with was hit. But it's not just big companies, smaller organizations, part of governments uh, uh, are also being hit. Uh, for example, uh, the city of Baltimore was hit with ransomware. 
Now just compare what I just told you about a $50 million ransomware hit. Baltimore in 2019 was hit with a ransomware attack and the attackers asked for only $76,000, which is shockingly low by today's news. But in 2019, that was impossible to imagine you would just hand over $76,000. And ultimately, I believe that they did not pay the ransom. I think it's public that they actually worked to recover their systems. In in 2018, the city of Atlanta was hit and uh, they were asked for $52,000. Uh, they ultimately paid well more than $52,000. They spent 2.6 million and they had lost revenue from uh, water bills and utility bills that went on for months and months. So I'm not trying to scare everyone into running back and unplugging your computer. I've always said the safest cybersecurity information tool is a brick because the only thing it conveys is a broken window, but it also isn't very utilitarian, you can't use it. So we all have to use the tools that are available to us, but we have to be careful. But these are just cautionary tales. I, I, I want to know how, how, how the threat spreads to all organizations. Go ahead, John, I'm sorry. Um, so you, you mentioned Apple, w- wouldn't it be more um, cost efficient if they just upgraded, if, well, any of them would just upgrade the ISO with a more uh, robust uh, ransomware or, or, or some firewalls to prevent uh, ransomware? So I'm gonna cover that a little bit in responses, but John, what I will say is, despite what movies and novels convey, there is no security appliance you can buy. There is no software I can install on my computers that stops all ransomware, because to me, as a chief information officer for my law firm, every attack looks like it's normal stuff. It looks like it's a machine that's talking to the internet. It looks like software that one of my technicians installed in response to a user request. So, Uh, so obviously, so I, and and with, with that being said, then it's obviously the only solution is a, um, is a, um, a double authentication as it relates to user and the things that you would accept, I guess, maybe. There there is a concept that was around. I adhered to it for, or I, I tried to follow it for a while, but it is impossible called an application whitelist that says, if it's not an application I know about, it will not run. Mm-hmm. Here's the problem, John. That software is getting patched every single month. Some of it's being patched multiple times a month. I, I don't have enough people to keep up with that list mm-hmm. of approved executable signatures. I don't have a list of approved websites. It changes so fast. No organization is going to be big enough to keep up with it. Yeah. Some of those concepts do apply to the inner circle your servers, and I do that for my servers, but I take some other steps also. For ordinary users using a Macintosh or a PC or a Chromebook or an iPad, we just can't keep up with it. I, I mean, all of you who use mobile devices know you get notices of mm-hmm. app updates daily, every day. There's some group of apps that have to be updated. Yeah. I will tell you about half of those are vendors who want to get back to the top of the iTunes list of new software. Some of it is oh my God, we have a broken thing. It's going to let people steal data. We better patch it right away. And you have to apply those patches. Well, and I would just say your, your system's only as safe as your users make it. And you make the stuff too tough and they are jumping off. They're using their own computers. Forget your system. And then they suck it all back into your system on the back end. So I, it just is, I know it must be very frustrating. Um, that's, a, that's a good point. And you're exactly right. That's a challenge I face every day. Uh, Justice Simmons, I, I, I have attorneys who want to find the easiest way to work with it. And if I don't give them a way to work with their iPad and uh, pencil, they're going to figure out a way to do it. And I have no idea what the risk is there. Here, here's some others I wanted to share. Uh, the U.S. government has been hacked. Uh, a lot of confidential information from employees as well as people who applied for top secret security clearance was stolen. That included that information that was st- that was stolen also included confidential information was provided uh, by those uh, candidates for um, uh, application for high security. Uh, the, hack- the hackers have hit the U.S. Army 52 times, according to this report. That was generally thought to be from small to large attacks. Um, but just 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 recently, there was another release of three billion 
email addresses and passwords that went along with them. Now they may be collections from a lot of places. They may be, you know, 50 different attacks. But what I will tell the people on this call is it is almost guaranteed if you've signed up with your personal email and a password to some service, it's been published. More than likely, one service you use has had an account and your password published. This is why it's important to use different passwords for every service. If you sign up to LinkedIn, LinkedIn was hit and over 200 million LinkedIn accounts were published. The password you use on LinkedIn, if it's the same one you use for your employer, you got to change them both right now. They got to be different. Uh, this, this is an ongoing war. It is happening and your information is being spread all over the place. Of course, everyone remembers Equifax. Equifax released uh, over a hundred, was it? Uh, I think it was about a hundred million people were hit with uh, information that was disclosed about uh, not only whether you had a, a, a bank account information, it included home addresses and it included uh, information that's commonly used to verify your identity like mother's maiden name. So your information is out there, it's public. Uh, we always worried about whether we should provide our phone number and our checks. Well, the damn check has our account number at the very bottom. We've been handing out our bank account information for the last 60 years. It's out there. Your information is out there. The best you can do is protect yourself. Okay, so I, I, I tried to give you the general scare and I'm gonna give you the specific one. Starting last year, a company called SoloWinds based right there in, in Austin. Uh, was not only discovered to be hacked, they were distributing software on behalf of a Russian hacker group. We call it an uh, advanced persistent threat group. Uh, this group was distributing software to SolarWinds subscribers. There are hundreds of thousands of SolarWinds subscribers. Every organization that has a large network was using SolarWinds or something like it. I use SolarWinds. I used it to tell me whether my servers are operating, whether a process is stopped, whether a link is alive. SolarWinds violated that trust because they became the avenue through which the bad guys were distributing software to my computers. And I was very lucky. We didn't run the version that was compromised, but a lot of organizations did. Um, these Orion servers were not only reporting information, they were installing software that I had told my computer, John, this is the example I was giving, about having a whitelist of approved software on my servers. I told my servers, SolarWinds is safe, you can run it. It was not safe. They were distributing software that was planted there by Russian agents. We don't know how far SolarWinds went. In fact, the government uh, reported that they had been hacked about the same time that uh, FireEye reported the general SolarWinds attack. And the only reason, the only reason we know about this attack today is because an employee at FireEye got a note from their system that said, hey, you just signed in from a computer in another state. That's the only reason. They had a reflecting account system that told them. Previously, Palo Alto, a top-notch information security company, they make firewalls, they discovered it, but they reported it as ancillary or anonymous data. They put in a defense against that attack and they reported it to no one. I'm not criticizing Palo Alto because we get reports like that all the time. It's very difficult to know how to respond. Um, in this case, SolarWinds breach attacked a large number of organizations and it is scary. What it means is a supplier to me became a threat to my organization and all of your organizations who use it. I'll give you another supplier uh, threat. Uh, Microsoft discovered or was told about a vulnerability in their servers as early as January of this year. They began working on a fix for it. Uh, they had the fix ready to go by March, but by then the attack had become so sophisticated that a lot of people hit the reports back to Microsoft in February that you need to push this upgrade out now. It is being used in the wild against Microsoft Exchange servers. Microsoft notified security researchers that were working with them. That notice from Microsoft to security researchers is now thought to have been a prompt to Chinese, Russian, and other state actors to attack and compromise as many exchange servers as you possibly can. 
Over a three week period, it's estimated that over 80,000 commercial exchange servers were attacked and as many as 125,000 over the next month. The company we trusted cooperated in providing information to the hackers. These supplier attacks are now terrifying. I have to worry about whether or not the, the update from Adobe is safe. Do I know? We get updates from Adobe all the time. What about a perimeter driver? We get told by HP, there's a new driver you need to download. How can we be sure now that that's safe? This goes back to the problem I was describing earlier. I don't know how to keep a list of approved programs up to date. And there was nothing in these programs that were distributed, including the exchange software that allowed others to take over it, that told me that it was a vulnerability. I heard one security researcher report to me at the InfraGuard that they believe that every exchange server that was directly connected to the internet was probably attacked in that two or three day period when Microsoft listed uh, that the fix was about to roll out. The threat is real. We're in the world of piracy. The pirates are out there. They are working against us and there is no British Navy sailing the high seas to help us. We got to help ourselves. We are Dennis, the ones who have to fix it. Dennis, I, I have a question sort of in the, in the context of, of our court system and the systems that we use. One of the things that I saw when we went through the ransomware attack was that we were fortunate that um, we had a separate e-filing system. We had a separate, you know, we have research taxes. Um, I, we're lucky here at the Supreme Court that there's an attorney out there named Don Cruz that scrapes all of our information and repackages it on his own blog. Um, you know, we've got a good relationship with Westlaw, which gave us access to documents as well that we had given them over the years. So um, it, it's one of the things I noticed though was like the Dallas Court of Appeals, for example, which has never really wanted to get on board with, you know, uniformity of IT management because they were on their own boat in that regard, they came out, you know, smelling like roses um, for the most part. Um, and, I, and I wonder, you know, as we push more towards uniformity of our system, are we creating more vulnerability in that regard? I mean, if we, we have, you know, one case management system that's run by one vendor, for example, uh, there are certainly advantages in efficiency, but that's that on the other hand, maybe create um, potential security issues. You're right. That is that is a conundrum faced by IT professionals every day. And some of the strategy you, you described, Blake, are things that we have to use to defend ourselves. Uh, but the information required to run a, an effective security group requires a breadth of knowledge and experience that A, is very expensive and requires a lot of person hours. Uh, I'm not gonna ask Terry to divulge how many information security experts he has working at Tyler Technologies. I won't typically disclose that information publicly about my law firm, but I will say I can't have enough. There is no way I could hire enough to protect my firm. But I do believe Microsoft, which has published publicly that they have almost 10,000 information security professionals are better positioned to defend themselves against a total ransom attack as opposed to some type of uh, infiltrating attack that um, steals or damages parts of their information. I agree, that's, that's a conundrum we all have to face. I, I'll give you another story. In uh, 2016, uh, the uh, Russians attacked a small tax software company in Ukraine. They thought it was going to be attack against Ukrainian businesses. And what happened is this company, like with SolarWinds, downloaded an update. They're kind of like TurboTax in that regard. These are vendors who use their software to file returns for divisions that exist in Ukraine. One of them was a large law firm, DLA Piper. They had one lawyer. I believe they reported that he was in Spain. He was helping one of his subdivisions prepare tax returns. He downloaded the update. Within 30 minutes, every computer a DLA Piper all over the world was erased. They were down for over three weeks. They lost everything. They lost backups. They lost everything. Uh, another company, Mare Shipping, got hit by this same attack. It's now called the Not Petya because it looked like the Petya attack, but it was not. It was purely disguised to look like ransomware, but it was not. It was just causing damage. 
Maersk lost everything. And in fact, the only way they were able to get back their information in less than three weeks was that they found one server that was offline in Nigeria at the time of the attack. They had to fly that server back to, I think they're in Denmark, to rebuild all of their user accounts. They were just lucky. Um, the National Health Service in, in UK wasn't as lucky. They were down for weeks. Um, you're right. There's a lot of threats out there. And it's. Well, it, so what kind of balance, I mean, do you think, knowing what you know about our court system and, and how these you know, systems work, what kind of balance do you think would be good between you know, individual counties running things? and, and what, what I can say is a county that does not have a professional staff of information security professionals of at least five people, and five is on the very low end, is not going to be effective at managing all of their information themselves. They can source that work out, Blake, to organizations that do have professional information security professionals, like hopefully Tyler Technologies, or in the case of email, uh, uh, Microsoft through Office 365 or through Google for Google Office. Uh, hopefully you're using suppliers who have their own professional information security staff and follow good information security hygiene. It's just very difficult in an organization that's using a managed service provider two counties over to be able to protect you. Because as I said earlier, the front line are your own employees. They're clicking on links, they're receiving email. And some of those emails are dangerous. And I hate to sound like a nervous Nelly about this, but that's, that's the way I view it. With uh, so many counties in the state that just don't meet the threshold of having enough staff to protect themselves, they're gonna have to rely on outside service providers. But if you put all of your information in one MSP, one managed service provider's bucket, you're trusting that MSP to give you all the protection you need. And I'm not always sure that that's necessarily gonna be the safest, unless they can assure you that they've met some of the standards we're gonna talk about in a little bit. Well, certainly redundancy saved us. I mean, that was the only way we were able to keep. Absolutely. So. Diversity and redundancy and isolation. Uh, we're gonna talk about that segmentation. All right, I've got some of the attack methods that are out there. This last bullet is the supply chain attack. I just wanted to mention that. That's a category that we didn't discuss much before six months ago, but now it's the biggest threat we all have because we all rely on our suppliers. So we have to figure out if I have to trust Hewlett Packard to give me print drivers that fix problems, how can I protect myself from that problem when it occurs? Uh, this is where we get into the defense that all organizations need to kind of adopt. At the very least, you have to apply layers. Separate your electronic mail world from your payroll world. There's no reason for those to be on the same network. They don't need to be on the same network. And indeed, if your email is provided by Microsoft through Office 65, by definition, it's already sitting on another network, probably in, a, in an Azure data center. If you're using ADP for your payroll, it's already sitting on an ADP network in another data center. So in some regard, you're protected. Now, Blake, your question about whether they're in one basket, you're right. AWS has, has a dozen data centers. What if an entire data center is taken offline? That's part of what your contract with those providers has to include. How do I protect myself against the single failure of a single data center resource? And that's what you're gonna have to ask that question. How do I make sure you've got some diversity? Okay, uh, I do wanna talk about this whole idea of accountability and governance. This is where we try and get good behavior from all of our employees, particularly those who handle sensitive information, but even those who don't. If they have an email account, they could potentially click on that message that says, hey, I'm from IT, click here and give me your password. That may not be your IT department. That may be somebody just phishing, using that, that method to get your credentials. You have to train your users how to avoid it. The first thing is somebody has to be in charge. And that someone needs to be the person who can mandate compliance. If you've got a department, I don't know who, let's say it's the, uh, the department that handles repairs of, of automotive vehicles, but they are sold a management system that they wanna plug into your network. If they have a system that is not being updated or patched or follows the procedures defined by the, uh, the information security department, then they have introduced risk. 
uh, the target was hit, I think in 2017 or 2018, they lost 70 million credit cards. In that case, they found out the risk came through an air conditioning provider. Someone installed air conditioners and they wanted to be able to manage the temperatures in their buildings. They connected to the same network that the credit card data was on. Again, you have to be able to segregate those things and someone has to make the rule and apply them and make sure everyone follows them. And in many cases, information technology alone doesn't have that authority. So you're gonna to have to find a way to segregate those. I think once you establish what those policies are, how you classify information, you then have to have somebody else, not your IT group, not yourself to come in and audit. They have to be the ones to make sure you're following your rules. As Casey pointed out, if the county IT department is creating the rules and they're auditing themselves, it is very easy to get blinders. The first time I brought in an ISO group to audit my law firm information technology group, we found dozens of things. And our information security is huge. I think it's 160 pages now. We, we found dozens of things that we'd overlooked. It's easy to get blinders. If you don't hire an outside auditor, you're gonna miss some things. You've gotta bring somebody in who's a professional who can read through that standard and understand what you're able to do. Okay, this next item I'm gonna talk about is important. All IT groups need to use it, but those of you who manage accounts for your own group, you need to use the least privilege necessary. In other words, it is easiest and every vendor, sorry, Terry, if you're still on, every vendor will tell you, it's just easiest to give everyone all rights. That way we don't have to decide who can see what. That is the most dangerous approach because one of those employees who has all rights is gonna click on that email. They're gonna fall prey to that phishing attack and they're gonna give their credentials away that now everyone can see, they're gonna give them away to an attacker from outside. That method may be used to further steal information, plant malware or distribute tools. Every account needs to be reviewed to use the least privilege necessary to get the job done. I will tell you this, that's hard. It is very difficult. I don't write all the software my law firm uses. I have to trust vendors and almost to a T, every vendor will say, you know what? It's just easier if you give this program domain administrative privilege, let it run at that level and everything will work fine. And if you do that, you're putting yourself at risk because that program now might become compromised and you will never know it. So you need to adopt the concept of least privilege. You also need to understand everything, accounts, usernames, applications all have an expiration date. If you don't go back and review the applications you're using, you're probably gonna be running something from 2016 that has no knowledge of the current threats and attacks. You have to constantly review. Accounts that aren't used by departed employees, if they're still out there, there is no employee to say, hey, someone signed into my account and used things in a way I didn't expect. If that employee's left and you haven't disabled or deleted that departed employee's account, you've created a vulnerability that you're blind to. You will have no way of knowing that that account is being used. You have to have an expiration date on everything. You need to have a clear identity access management system. If you do not, you're going to have users signing in from all over the globe to your remote systems, and you may not know that it's not that employee. Uh, that includes multi-factor access. In some cases, it may include biometrics. It, it may include a little certificate that's on every device to make sure that it's your device that's signing into a VPN. You have to have some way of managing that. Finally, the most important thing I, you, I think you have to do is security awareness for your employees. And I believe the number one tool that you can use in, as far as training your own employees is a phishing campaign. I, I know my attorneys and my employees at, at the law firm I work for get phishing messages. We try to track for those, but I know they get fished by my people. We fish them six times a year and anyone who fails, we fish them again. And if they fail again, we expire their password, we make them go through training again, and we fish them again. We have to keep fishing them until they don't fall for it. And I'll tell you, if there's one thing you don't want is a partner yelling at you because he got tricked by a message that said that he's got a complaint with the Bar Association. But that's one of the campaigns that people were using was they were sending fake bar complaints out to attorneys in the state of Texas, and it was a phishing campaign. But I have to do it. Otherwise, my users may be handing out credentials. Employees in your organization are probably falling prey to some of these phishing campaigns. And maybe they're just stealing credit card numbers. 
but they may be trying to trick the user to download a piece of software that gives control of your systems. Uh, I will say, if you're using Office 365, if your county uses Office 365 email, Microsoft includes with that subscription, a tool they just announced in uh, March uh, uh, to simulate a phishing attack. If your IT group in your county or in your um, department or, or your uh, organization is not doing these phishing attacks, it's a good idea to bring that up to them. It's in the notes, Casey's got those notes. Uh, it, it was just announced in March. I use a different company because I don't use Exchange Online yet, uh, but I do fish my users and it's important. I think it's the only way to know what your risk is and what people will do. Okay, a final category I'm gonna cover are these uh, asset uh, management controls. This includes devices, software. Um, it can include just about everything except people. You need to know what you have. You need to know that it's up to date. I will tell you that all of you have somewhere in your organization, a conference room with a video conference machine. That video conference machine, if it's not being patched regularly, it has vulnerabilities. If it's on the same network where you do legal work, it is likely going to become an avenue that's going to be used to try and steal that information. What you think is confidential may not be. Every device, printers, uh, room control systems, if you've got a Crestron control system, it has to be reviewed and updated. Anything that's over five years old, it probably has vulnerabilities you don't even know are there. You're going to have to segregate those things into separate networks so that they don't have access to your valuable data. You have to review every account tied to every system. Every system that I install on my network includes not only software, but also an account that runs it. Not account for a person, it's running through its own service account. Those service accounts have to be rotated regularly. And I'll tell you, vendors do not like it when you rotate their service account passwords. But if you're not changing those every six months, they're likely going to be used against you. Your IT group needs to know what's there and they have to manage those things. Finally, I'm gonna say you have to have some type of monitoring system. Um, we call this a SIM. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a log where all of your systems report what it's doing. Those organizations I described that were attacked, the very first thing that the cybersecurity remediation group did was they asked, where's your SIM? And they go through that SIM line for line looking for every step that took place. They will never know if you're safe if, they don't, if you don't have a monitoring and logging system. And I will tell you that um, I have an operation center that operates 24 hours a day. They monitor that log. If my own staff had to monitor it, I, I would need 10 times the number of people I've got. It's just impossible. Every organization needs to contract for an outside uh, SOC, a, a security operations center that monitors your log and tells you when you've got a problem. Otherwise, the first time you'll know that there's a problem is when every PC in your organization pops up and says, you've been hit by the XYZ company, you need to pay us $190,000 or we're gonna lease your data to the internet. You don't want that to be the first time you know you've got a problem. You want that sound to tell you about it. Uh, okay, we talked about an incident response plan and a disaster plan. Uh, we talked about disaster plans before in the concept of protecting your data, but the incident response plan is so vital because when you are hit, you've got to know who's making the decisions. It can't be George, the IT guy who works in a tiny closet down the hallway. You need to get the executives in your organization involved. If you don't know their home number, or if the only way you reach them is through your organization's email, you're going to have a bad day. You need to have an out of band way of communicating with all those people. They all have to be involved. And personally, I think your incident response plan needs to include a vendor you can call on. I don't know if it's Dell SecureWorks. I don't know if it's Mandiant through FireEye. You need to have somebody you can call and say, oh my God, I need your help. And they will fly somebody in, they'll work remote. They will get people there to help you. If your plan doesn't include that, that is not the time to be going through the yellow pages when you see that message on your screen saying your computers are locked. You need to have that in the plan already. I will also say that your disaster plan needs to include a way of managing your backups. If your backups are on the same network 
where the computers they're backing up are, they're almost certainly going to be hit by the same cyberware ransomware attack, or if they're in the same building where your servers are, they're going to be hit by the same tornado. You need to find a way to separate your backups. Um, some people say they need to be uploaded to a cloud. Some people say they need to be uploaded to an isolated server. I'm not going to tell you which way is right, but you need to put some thought into it and decide what the risk is right for your organization. Okay, and then I talked about limited access, and then I'm going to say the last thing, you've got to test. If you've never tested your incident response plan, you're going to have a bad day someday. You have to test your disaster plan. You have to test your incident response plan. And I'm going to also share, I think your IT group needs to hire a group. We're going to call them the red team to try and penetrate your network. They're going to tailgate workers. They're going to walk in. They're going to unplug printers. They're going to turn printers around, read addresses off of the back of it. They're going to unplug telephones and plug little Linux boxes that they brought with them. They're going to leave devices in closets. They're going to try every way to tell you what, what your risk is. If you don't do that penetration test, you won't know what your risk is. It's embarrassing. I've done now four penetration tests. We're right in the middle of our fourth one right now. And they find stuff all the time. I'm shocked at the number of my employees who give helpful advice. Yeah, this person on the help desk told me how to reset my password. I didn't know it. I wasn't the person who I said I was. They helped me reset the password and they made me run off a 26 character string. That's embarrassing for me because I have procedures, but I have a high, uh, a lot of people call it white glove service model. So I have to, on the one hand, provide that white glove service. On the other, I have to say, where did you go to law school? Um, who did you marry? On what day? I have to ask embarrassing questions at my help desk before I give that kind of help. If you don't do that penetration test, you won't know how helpful your help desk is in letting the bad guys in. Casey has no idea what you're talking about. Never happened to him. Um, <laughs> I, I, um, I was um, wondering if Casey could comment on what resources are available to counties if they're victims of a ransomware attack. Is there a state entity they can reach out to? Yeah, definitely. For the for our local counties, uh, DIR is extremely helpful. So when Dennis talks about managed service providers and having that person to call, oh my God, I need help right now. Um, I know that DIR is there to help out with that and counties can leverage that too. And so like with our specific incident, I was on the phone with DIR while I was on the way to the office arranging for that person to meet me there so that we could have our investigation ongoing within within hours of knowing that there was an issue. And those are available to counties as well. Um, there are other organizations that, um, that the Department of Homeland Security runs with uh, CISA and the MSISAC that counties can join or their IT departments can join that do provide a lot of uh, very rudimentary and basic cybersecurity measures with as far as uh, what Dennis was talking about, penetration testing, um, application scanning, uh, domain blocking, they do all that at no charge that counties can leverage those kinds of things today, along with the, the phishing attack simulators that Dennis mentions if you're on Office 365. So there's definitely a, a, a checklist, if you will, of things that we can, that the committee can put together that counties can leverage today um, at, virtually, at pretty much no cost other than their time. And what about on the criminal end of things, Casey? I, I would assume that there's usually going to be a criminal investigation. And Definitely. So in most cases, when you have a cybersecurity incident, um, there's a group that comes in to do an investigation to figure out how they got in the door and, and what they did to do that. Simultaneously with that, um, we have connections through InfraGuard, uh, is another organization that we, we uh, connect with that put us together with the FBI and DPS. And so the FBI and DPS aren't generally there to help you recover. They just want to get in and get the evidence so that they can put a case together uh, for the bad guys. I do know from personal experience with ransomware that uh, the FBI segregates based on the evidence that they collect. They can tell who which group did that. And so um, usually what they do is they group those together to say, oh, 
this attack was done by so and so and so and so based on all that evidence and we're running a case against them out of the Tampa Bay office and um, here's the agent that's going to contact you to get information we're already trying to track them down um, but we'll let you know if we get them but if we don't get them we don't get them so I, I, I'm, I'm just going to summarize and say, look, we're moving towards zero trust. That's kind of the response that you were uh, alluding to, uh, Blake, earlier. Trust no one, but, you know, at least when you do trust, isolate that trust. Keep it in separate silos or buckets or whatever you want to call it. Segregate functions. Uh, I've got a page here with some of those resources. Casey has my entire slide uh, set, which includes a lot of the notes, which includes some of these hyperlinks. Uh, uh, Casey, you're free to post that. I'm not sure where we post any. Yeah, I'll make sure that, that, that our group gets it, definitely. I, I think that will be helpful. You can contact me. My email address is in there as well. I'll be glad to help you. I, I, I will say I've been in information technology for almost 40 years. I used to be the guy who would show people cool ways of doing things. I was the guy who said, why are we still distributing this on paper? Put it online. I, I am now the guy who walks around and says, who the hell told you you could do that? You can't run that, that's not allowed. I'm now, I've become a beat cop. I walk around with a stick and I start hitting people because they're doing things that I haven't done a risk assessment on. I, it's a different job. And I'm sorry to add a little paranoia to everyone's day, but you now have got a little taste of my paranoia. Does anyone have any other questions that you want to ask to me or Casey? Casey's been through this uh, as much as I have. Dennis, would you mind sharing your slides with um, some of the group if they want to have them? Yeah. I thought it was yeah. a great presentation and I really, I, I think there's a lot of clerks or administrators that would benefit from your, from your uh, presentation. Yes, ma'am. Casey has the list. He's prepared to hand it out to everybody. And it includes my speaking notes as well, which includes some of the unique URLs that I referred to. Okay. Yeah, and, and Judge, this afternoon after the meeting, I'll make sure everybody on JCIT gets a copy of all the presentations that we had today so that you can go back and look. These three organizations, Casey alluded to them, MSISAC is for state agencies. I belong to one for law firms. Uh, the InfraGuard is, a, is an FBI private business association. It is free. It is incredibly valuable. Please join them. Uh, the Houston InfraGuard is the largest one in the nation, but I know that there are other InfraGuards around the state as well. Uh, and then CISA has a lot of valuable information. Listen, two years ago, I would have told you the federal government is the last person you, you, you want to go to for cybersecurity information. CISA has changed that. They've become much better in the last year. I think you will find them as a valuable resource. And while I know that most of the people in this meeting aren't necessarily the ones who are um, doing the information technology and information security, you can share that information with those people you work with. And, and to build on what Dennis said, MSISAC and CISA both have no cost services that are very easy to implement and very easy to use. Um, and we leverage those at OCA and, and, and it's, it's good free stuff that makes me sleep a little bit better at night. Okay, I will stop my presentation now and turn it back over to Casey and Justice Simmons, you can and take it from here. Well, I think that's our, we went a little bit over, but it was very, very valuable. And I think that's our last presentation for today. Um, we will be circulating um, another um, uh kind of poll just to get an idea of when is good for our next JCIT meeting, which I perceive will be live in Austin. Um, so take that, uh, bear that in mind when you're asked when it's convenient for you to meet. Um, so we'll be in Austin and um, we're coming up with dates. I think we need to have uh, uh, basically an updated report that we'll go over regarding the order situation. I think the cybersecurity, probably we should always hear a little bit about that at every meeting. And then hopefully we can get some more information about the conversion of um, evidence or the conversion of videos, proprietary information, and you know how that's going to apply. So 
Um, if anybody doesn't have any other business, um, I'm going to recommend that we close now and we will see each other again, hopefully in person uh, within the next few months. So with that, thank you all for joining and uh, thank you, Justice Boyd, for also joining as well and taking time to be with us today. Thank you and we're signing